Okay. Welcome to this uh, after reception party on the topic of doping. Are everybody here or should we wait one more minute? No, we start. Uh, my name is Andreas Selios. I'm from Norway and I am in the program committee of Play the Game. However, I'm not responsible for staging this session this late and after the reception. So if you have any complaints, please send a telefax to Henrik Brandt or Horse Telegram or something like that. So can he fix this next time? Uh, first, it's a little bit uh, Danish humor here, because on my name tag it says chair. And I'm the only person here without a chair, so I don't know if you tried to trick me, but... I cope. If I get tired, I go and sit over there. Okay for you? Fine. Uh, the topic or the, the title of this pl first plenary session of Play the Game is called A New World Code Against Doping. Who is willing to comply? Uh, we have four panelists uh, trying to answer some of the questions under this title here. They sit there. It's Sandro Donati. It's um, it's uh, Frederick Donce, it's Mike, Mikhail Ask, and Hajo Seppelt. I, I will give them a, a more introduction when uh, it's their time to speak. They have 15 minutes each, and I'm very strong. It's not more than 15 minutes. Uh, after you have uh, uh, held your uh, speech, we have approximately 50, 55 minutes for Q&As, so you, we can interact with the audience. The uh, first speaker is a familiar person to the Play the Game family, it's Sandro Donati. Uh, he received the Play the Game award in 2007 in Reykjavik. He did not remember when he got it, but it's in 2007 in Reykjavik. And that was because of uh, your uh, work and fight against doping, especially in uh, Italy. And now also you are a consultant to, for instance, WADA. So the floor is yours. The title of your speech, uh, speech is Doping must be tackled at the source, the rest is appearance. So the judicial investigation and judgment of the court of Ferrara in 2004 on the activities of doping by Professor Francesco Conconi have highlighted the responsibility of many high-level international athletes, but above all the responsibility of Italian Olympic Committee, USI and International Olympic Committee, real accomplices. Professor Conconi practiced doping with Ipo and at the same time suggested Verbruggen at the limit of hematocrit in the biological passport or interacted with the International Olympic Committee to cheat the sporting community for seven years on a method which really did not exist to detect, detect Ipo in urine. The Operation Puerto, concerning the activities of doping of the Spanish doctor Eufemiano Fuentes, highlighted the responsibilities of a number of Spanish athletes, but also athletes of other countries, including Ian Ruric and Ivan Basso, but remained unexplored covert policies that have allowed Fuentes silent about the responsibilities of the national sports federations and big Spanish clubs. The Balco scandal involving many U.S. athletes and, at and athletes from other countries, but few experts have worked to rebuild the protections that for many years national sports federations have provided to athletes capable of winning Olympic medals. In 2003, Edwin Moses resigned from the Ethics Commission and thus explained his decision 
I do not believe that the test to find the EPO, THG and other substances are done in a professional manner. And I speak not only of athletics. Too often I see leaders who prefer to turn head away. Referring to the rec recent scandal of the International Athletic Federation database full of, of abnormal blood values, Moss said, we would be remiss if we didn't also take this opportunity to examine on a larger scale the inherent conflict of interest that exists when a sport is tasked with both policing and promoting itself. This is especially true when those actions may in turn damage the image of the sport or a profitable, high-profile athlete. We have seen this conflict of interest play out time and time again, all to the detriment of clean athletes. I now urge IAF president-elect Sebastian Coe to make good on his recent calls for the establishment of an independent anti-doping program in athletics. I give you an example. There is uh, an investigation in the north of Italy, in Bozen, uh, and now we are arrived to the trial. The trial will begin uh, the 5th of November, uh, in which there are involved some officials of the uh, Italian Athletic Federation. Between them, there is a, 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 a medical specialist who was the responsible of anti-doping and uh, uh, sanitary sector of the Italian Federation, in the same moment, he was the central point of the blood uh, uh, biological uh, uh, passport for International Athletic Federation. So a total situation of conflict of interests. Of course, he took decision not only for foreign address, but also for Italian address. These and many other cases demonstrate that often, alongside the responsibility of individual adults or of individual doctors or coaches, there are serious responsibility of sport institutions, national Olympic committees, national sport federations, and international sport federations. Many seem to forget that the responsibility of the individual is contingent and limited in scope to his person or to his entourage, while the responsibilities of the institutions are the ones that until now have ensured doping penetration, consolidation, camouflage system, camouflage system. In summary, the sport institutions sometimes, with the complicity of the government institutions, have made doping monstrous and now difficult, but not impossible, to eradicate. WADA, in what way is addressing the problem? With good will, with the ability and honesty of many of its members, but with their hug uh, limits of competence and authority. It is proof that the word anti-doping code, by listing the types of responsibilities for doping, merely indicates individuals, athletes especially, and other surrounding figures, but it spets nothing and nothing can about the possible responsibilities of entire institutions. The creation of WADA and his attempt to give life in the different countries to the national anti-doping agencies has collided heavily with this reality. In some countries, they have been set up national anti-doping agencies directly dependent, for example in Italy, on the national sport institutions and therefore deprived of autonomy and impartiality. In other countries, they have been slightly created with the full agreement of national governments, agencies, autonomous, autonomous all in appearance. WADA has worked hard in the development, development of the World Anti-Doping Code, trying to create a unification and procedures, all activities formally correct, but which are then compromised in substance from the ambiguous nature of the national anti-doping agencies and above all, by the international federations who defend their autonomy, meaning its political and commercial interests. Briefly, the stagnation of the situation is demonstrated by the fact that the World Anti-Doping Code provides carefully the various responsibilities of individuals, but makes no provision regarding the macro responsibility of sport institutions. This is the article number 12, 
noting in the code precludes any signatory or government accepting the code from enforcing its own rules for the purpose of imposing sanctions on another sporting body over which the signatory or a member of the signatory or government has authority. It's therefore clear that VADA has no power over the, resp over the resp responsibilities of the national sport institutions. And to sanction the responsibilities of the international federations, we must resort to the United States Nations. VADA still has a good reputation, thanks to the considerable initial work done by Dick Pound and David Oman to provide it, it with official and experts capable and in independent, but that, that initial capital is destined to be lost in the perpetually losing battle with the autonomy of the international federations and with the ambiguous position of many national anti-doping agencies. A good step forward would result from promulgation in the main countries of criminal anti-doping laws, Thanks to the development of the investigations, the magistrates and the police would become powerful allies of WADA. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you ran 15 minutes on seven minutes. That's very good. Yeah. And I, you can start to question my authority as a chair. Everybody ran away when I sat there. So. But we continue. Uh, next speaker is uh, a person who has been mentioned earlier today by Jens in his introduction speech. Uh, we invited um, uh, Julia Stepanova and Vitali Stepanov to come here because uh, of what they told in the documentary uh, called How Russia Creates Champions. But they feared for their lives, so they would not come. But we have the maker of the documentary here, and that is Hayo Seppelt. Uh, he will talk about the process before, during, and after making of this documentary, as far as I know. The floor is yours. First of all, I have to say I'm not a native speaker, so excuse me if my English is not perfect. And I know that I have 15 minutes. I'm not also good in PowerPoint presentations, so I talk to you uh, directly, and you have to look at me and not on the screen, please. <laughs> okay, I give you seven, seven minutes about Russia. I give you seven minutes about IWF. Uh, we, have, we have made two, two documentaries. The first one was aired in German television in December 2014. Um, and uh, afterwards uh, broadcast in a few other countries in different languages and the same happened with a second documentary which was broadcast uh, on August 1st, uh, 2015 and it was a kind of follow-up um, trying to find out if in Russia has something happened in between or afterwards um, to look if they really tried to improve the situation or not and uh, some parts have been um, focused on Kenya and the major issue was in cooperation, a very, very good cooperation with the London uh, based Sunday Times with my colleagues of the inside department there was a big long-term investigation and evaluation of a database uh, leaked by an informant and uh, to us and uh, to me in, in, in Germany so I could uh, share this information with my colleagues in London and the research and the outcome of the evaluation was as you know uh, um, really huge and um, um, created a lot of uh, opposition, of resistance, uh, um, particularly from the International Athletics Federation, which uh, called that as a declaration of war. But I want to focus first on the first documentary, which was aired in, in December last year. And um, yeah, I just would like to begin with the Sochi Olympic Games um, and maybe also with a um, short um, um, short break uh, uh, to tell you what is the background of our investigation in general. We have uh, founded an anti-doping or a doping research department in WDR, which is a West German regional network of ARD. ARD is the biggest public network in Europe, uh, apart from BBC or maybe together with BBC. And uh, yeah, and uh, in 2007, after the Tour de France scandal, um, the German television uh, bosses decided to found a uh, doping research department uh, 
um, considering that if you spend so many TV rights on um, um, live coverage of sports like Tour de France, like World Cup, like Olympic Games, you should do the same with research, Not may, maybe not the same, but at least to spend some money also in investigation on sports. They asked me to, 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 to join that uh, department because I was working on doping stories for my former employer already. Um, 10 years and so this was an initial starting point of this uh, department. So we have the capacity, we have the um, a budget, we have the possibilities, we have good conditions to work and to investigate doping in sports. And so in 2014 I went to the Olympic Games in Sochi and did some research and some reports about doping. Uh, in Russia, and um, this was obviously the reason for that after the Olympic Games, um, another informant approached me and asked me if I would like to be uh, connected to Vitali and Yulia Stepanov. And I said, okay, that sounds interesting. So I traveled to Moscow and um, uh, met them the first time, and I didn't see them today, I didn't watch the Skype connected um, the, the video because I was still on, the, on my way to, to Aarhus, but um, yes, what I heard from other people, they told me that um, Vitali and Julia obviously impressed a lot of people because of the way they are dealing with the whole case of anti-doping, particularly um, Vitali who speaks fluently English. Um, yes, and I met him in, in, in spring 2014 and he told me that he is a, a former member or former um, uh, um, employee of, of the Russian anti-doping agency and he would like to share with me information about corruption and about wrongdoing in Rosada and if I would be, be interested. I said yes, I'm interested, I'm very much interested. So this had to be completely confidential as you can imagine. And uh, the problem was that this was a really dangerous approach from his side to me because you can imagine that in Russia to talk about anti-doping and to blame the country can lead to some, can, uh, to some uh, very bad reactions from the government or from, from the authorities. So this had to keep strictly confidential and we continued to, to meet each other for several months. And I wanted, as you can imagine, I'm a journalist, so I want to, <laughs> to uh, publish information. I want to run a story. First, I thought it may be a 10-minute story, a 50-minute story. Then I realized it's, it's getting more and more interesting. There's so much to tell. There's so much background. And for me, surprising was at that time that without any approach, without any influence from my side, they offered me that they would like to do some hidden recordings. That means they would like to do some hidden video recordings, audio recordings. What they have done already, they told me that, in 2013. Because they are aware of the fact that it doesn't make sense just to claim something, you have to prove something. And that's what they wanted to do. And that is exactly the same what we have to do in journalism. We have to, we have to uh, prove something bef before we air. Uh, an accusation and uh, so they provided a lot of information, a lot of video re and, and audio recordings already from 2013 and they told me that they would like to continue with that. So Vitali, who is more or less the spirit of the whole operation, alongside with his, um, uh, woman, uh, with his uh, wife, a former 800 meter runner who was at that time banned because of doping, um, they told me that they would like to, to tell me everything in detail what happens in Russian athletics. So they continued to make hidden recordings. I told them, fantastic, if you, if you don't want that we air it, we do, will not, never air it, but if you agree that we can use this uh, footage, we would like to use it. So the precondition was that they have to leave the country. If they don't leave the country, we cannot air the program. Uh, so I tried to find people in Germany at that time who are maybe interested to ask Julia to be member of, the, of a German athletics club and to get uh, uh, to ask um, someone in Germany to get a job for, for Vitali. It was not that easy because the people didn't know them. This, so they, they spent a lot of time in Germany already at that, at that in, in summer 2014. And then uh, we continued in, in, in research and uh, finally there was a 
possibility to, to I cannot comment on the details now, but there was a possibility to, to bring them to Western Europe in fall 2014. So this happened, I could do an interview with Vitali and Julia, and we could use all the hidden recordings. I got some other information from other sources, so we could, could run the story. What I want to say, and I mean that really serious, um, in regards to Vitali and Julia, Maybe the comparison is a little bit exaggerated, but I would say that f from a sports perspective, and on a I have to admit that on a much lower level, but for me, Vitali is one of the biggest heroes in the world of sports, because this guy was so focused on anti-doping, he was so focused on the truth, he was so focused on helping sports to get that clean, that I was so impressed by him, he is really a personality, and he is so modest, he is more a shy person, but he just wanted to help sports to get rid of doping. And this is, was really very impressive for me. And um, yeah, at the end, I have to say for me, he is a, the greatest whistleblower in the history of sports, because this was really a huge task, and it was really scary, it was really dangerous for him, but he did it and he was aware that he has to leave his country for that reason, and he did it with his small little son Robert, with his wife Julia. So they came to Western Europe in November 2014. We could air the story, and you know what the impact was. Um, the first time um, it was more or less clear, because of the whole evidence that Russia has, has a, I wouldn't call it a systematic, I would call it a systemic doping problem, which is not a new one, it is an old one, it's a traditional one that comes from former Soviet Union times. So this was, this was really, a, I have to say that, really one of the most important documentaries I've, I've ever made. And um, yeah, and Vitaly and Julia had to live after the documentary protected by the authorities. And I can say now that they are living at a certain place somewhere in the world protected by people who want to help them. They are safe. They don't have to fear that someone is coming around the corner and wants to hit them or want to do something even more. And I tell that because the outcome, the official outcome of the whole investigation from the WADA Investi Investigative Commission, um, we ex still accept, expect, and it will come in the next couple of, of weeks, I guess. And so it's better that uh, the whole family is now protected at a place um, somewhere in the world. But again, I have to say, without their contribution, I would have never been in the situation to run that story. So I have to say again what Bonita already mentioned today in her presentation. Whistleblowers are the fifth state in the democracy. And now they are in the democracy, and that's good for them. That's about Vitali and Julia. I hope that it has been seven minutes, maybe eight. I don't know. Now we continue with the second documentary. The second documentary was a follow-up. It was clear for me that we have to focus on what happens after the first documentary was aired, what happens with Julia and with Vitali, what will happen in Russia. Interestingly is that there have been two angles. The first one was Russia, the Russian Ministry of Sports, in particular, the Minister of Sports, Mr. Mutko, denied everything. They told that is everything what we aired was a pack of lies. They said that all the recordings are fakes. They said that uh, I'm not informed about the situation in Russia. I have no clue about what's going on there. Um, uh, Vitali and Yulia are liars. It was always the same. It was so ridiculous, to be honest. And uh, it showed me again that obviously the, the Russian anti-doping agency, what Sandro Donati already said, they are so dependent on the government, they are so dependent on, on the authorities that they are obviously not able to tell the truth because the truth was obvious, but they didn't want to accept that. Um, and the second angle, which was also very interesting, was IWF, because after we aired the first documentary, um, I did small reports afterwards, two little reports, seven minutes, ten minutes, 
in German television. And this, a third part of this um, series in, in, in December last year showed abnormal blood values, a list of, of, of um, um, blood values of athletes, only 150 values, but very, very suspicious. Uh, and uh, because this list was from an internal database from IWF and was called suspicious or highly suspicious already by the IWF doctors, <laughs> this was very interesting. It was from 2006 to 2008, and when we published that, and an, an informant from the IWF circles told me that uh, there was never any really serious and substantial and focused follow-up on these athletes with suspicious values. This created obviously a big alarm in IWF and then they told me that all what I did was not correct in regards to this database. Um, I'm not really informed about uh, IWF is working on that and they wanted to sue me, they wanted, um, um, they threatened me. Uh, I got letters from, from um, a law firm based in London telling me that if I, if I don't confirm within 24 hours that all what I said is not correct and um, uh, that I confirm that I will never release this database to third parties, they will sue me. Um, uh, thanks to my uh, department and thanks to my network in Cologne, they are very powerful and they are, they are serious and helpful and they told me, don't worry, Hayo. Uh, we will we will handle the situation and so on. nothing happened. It was just a threat from my opinion. Interestingly, and maybe some of maybe an, I, I don't know if an IWF representative is here in the room. Um, for me, the behavior of the federation was so embarrassing because I had to, I, I was invited to two other conferences in in March and in in Lausanne, a WADA. Uh, meeting and another um, conference in London. And can you imagine that IWF wrote me another time a letter, that means a law firm based in London, and told me, I, we, we have heard about that you will um, present, be present at two conferences in London and in Lausanne, and we would be very grateful if you could tell us in advance what you will show there or what you will present there. It's the first time in my life that the Internet Federation, and I'm working for 30 years a journalist, <laughs> told me, asked me to tell them what I will present at a conference. I think that, for me, I thought they are based in Monaco, it is in the heart of Europe, they have a law firm in London, they know what democracy is, they know what press freedom is, but they dare to ask a journalist and the obvious background was again to threaten us and to, to um, and they again threatened us and told us that they will sue us um, if, we, if we have any wrongdoing from their perspective. So this was the situation in, in spring 19, uh, 2015. At the same time we prepared another documentary and I was luckily enough that I, I received from an uh, informant and I have to be. I have to thank again. Uh, be very um, grateful and thank him a lot that he allowed me to use uh, information. I got a database, and this database was evaluated and was scrutinized and checked by a data team from the Sunday Times, and was again um, uh, evaluated by two, one or maybe two of the most famous and um, recognized experts on the field of blood doping, Robin Parisotto and Mike Ashenden in, in Australia. So we, we, um, we, um, this was a part of the second documentary in, 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 in August, and it really took us four months in total to just to prepare the whole documentary. And at the same time, just to give you an, an, an idea, we approached regularly the IWF asking for interviews with Sebastian Coe, with Labine Diak, with um, the head of the anti-doping department at that time, but they didn't accept any interview, any. It was not possible to g get one interview with one of these representatives, and for the background you, would, should, you should know that ARD Television, in, in cooperation with ZDF, uh, via the European Broadcasting Union, we are paying a lot of money for the TV rights to cover athletics. So I think, from this standpoint, we have a right to ask all the critical questions. 
but these people don't want to reply. At the end, as, as I said already, it, uh, Sebastian Coe called it a declaration of war. And um, yes, we published this database and I think this shed a light and a really intensive light on how um, um, athletics, at least endurance um, athletes, have been involved heavily in doping. At least it was a very, very big suspicion and uh, it shed a light on ab absolutely abnormal blood values you would never imagine. And uh, um, um, 800 athletes have been involved um, with really, really, really strange and n not re believable, not credible blood values at that time, which gives us the feeling and also to, to the experts' opinion that there was a very, very high um, possibility, uh, probability of, of blood doping at that time, and that from 2008 to 2012. So as maybe every one of you knows what was the result, it was a big discussion, um, it was a fight, she said, he said, always the same. And now we are curious to learn what the WADA Investigative Commission, who extended his mandate after the Russian um, accusations and now is also checking um, the accusations uh, against IWF and we will see what will be the outcome but I think and that is maybe the, that will be the end of my short presentation it shows that what Bonita Masiado said already that I think whistleblowers are so important in the fight against doping and I only can encourage uh, all of them that if they consider to, to, to deliver information, to provide, provide information to journalists, there are some serious people in, in, in Europe, Sunday Times on London, I think we also have um, proved that we are working seriously and there are some other newspaper colleagues, also TV, co TV colleagues who, who can help, who can really help to improve the situation in the fight against doping. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thanks, Sayo. You went over time, but I borrowed five minutes from uh, Sandro, so that's okay. 1732. <laughs> uh, when you have to appoint a detective chief superintendent to fight doping, then you are in trouble. Um, Anti-doping Denmark did that. They appointed uh, Mikhail Ask four or five months ago, and the first thing you had to do was to present the report on doping in Danish cycling 1998-2015, and you will tell us a little bit more about that report. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Andreas, and I guess I have 13 minutes and... No, no, we are, you can borrow two minutes from Sandro. Okay. I will, I will put my watch down here and try and uh, <laughs> keep track of time. Okay. Okay. So um, what started as an ordinary uh, doping case, although uh, more extensive than normal, uh, actually ended up with a two and a half year long investigation that resulted in um, concrete sanctions for violate, violating anti-doping rules, but also, and that is actually in our opinion more, more important, uh, revealed massive failures by owner and leading sports directors of the by far most successful professional Danish cycling team ever. And the comprehensive collection of data uh, the investigation group did also gave um, some unique insight of the special structure and culture within professional cycling. All factors playing a pivotal role to the fact that professional cycling, at least previously, was perhaps more exposed to doping than other sports disciplines. For that reason, this report, uh, which I'm going to present uh, the main conclusions and recommendations on, um, not only concludes on the concrete anti-doping rule violation, but also gives some general recommendations to the sport uh, uh, when it comes to cultural and structural matters. So, the beginning of the case was the so-called so -called US Postal case, uh, where it was revealed that the so-called rider number 14 was uh, equal with Michael Rasmussen, uh, and um, it started, it launched an international cooperation between the anti-doping Denmark 
the uh, US Anti-Doping Agency, USADA, the Dutch Doping Authorities, and WADA. And um, Michael Rasmussen, he, uh, he gave subst substantial assistance to the investigation, and uh, here you can see the, the main, uh, the main um, parts of his uh, doping case. Admitted uh, extensive use of doping from 98 to 2010, APO, denipo, cortisone, etc. Ownership of a blood transfusion machine in Austria, considering even to use his father's blood, and he received assistance from his team doctor uh, at the Dutch team Rebel Bank. So the consequences of the case against Michael Rasmussen was uh, that uh, he uh, gave, uh, he revealed uh, other persons' involvement in anti-doping rule violations, of course. And we have, uh, of course, brought these cases to uh, the doping tribunals, uh, also internationally. And uh, because of his uh, substantial assistance, the uh, sentence, uh, when it comes to Rasmussen, was reduced from eight to, to two years. And um, we also have to, uh, no matter what you think of, uh, of Michael Rasmussen and his doping uh, abuse, we uh, considered all the way through this investigation his um, statements as trustworthy. And that was also the reason that we could we had to move on uh, with um, another investigation, which was uh, what you can see up here in number four and number five, that it actually showed that the doping in daily cycling generally was probably much worse than expected. And therefore, this follow-up uh, investigation was launched, and it ended up being this report on doping in Danish cycling in this period. So the purpose uh, of the investigation, uh, the second investigation, this report was to uh, first of all follow up on the, um, the alleged anti-doping rule violations uh, which were uh, presented against Danish, other Danish cycling riders, but also uh, leaders and support personnel. And we also, uh, the examination group also decided to uh, look into to the doping, uh, the culture and the patterns of professional cycling. and. Um, when it came to the, uh, the methodology of the investigation, there was, uh, the only way to do it was to ask the participants to give uh, interviews on a voluntary basis. There are no legal means whatsoever to, to, to force people to do that. And um, in many ways, it was also the best way to do it because, as I said before, one of the main um, objectives of this investigation was not so much the concrete individual anti-doping rule violations, most of them were anyway uh, too old to be, uh, to be uh, punished anyway. So it was also a matter of uh, getting as much knowledge as possible about professional cycling in this period, period to uh, look into this uh, culture and these structural matters, as I mentioned before. And consequently, that also means that we actually possess more information uh, about uh, anti-doping uh, in this period than actually concretely stated in the report. Approximately 50 persons were interviewed, some of them several times. As you can see, it was a combination of active riders, former riders, and leaders and support personnel, altogether 50 persons. And um, the overall conclusions was that there was a mass massive uh, massive failures and ignorance of uh, the responsibility, in our opinion, and extended responsibility as a leader, as a manager, by owner and sports directors of the by far most successful Danish cycling team, which has been known under several names during the years, but mainly under the name Jack and Jones and CSC. And concretely, it, it comes down to the, uh, the owner, Bjarne Ries, and two of his sports directors, Johnny Wells and Alex Peterson. Um, they have been responsible for and part of a widespread abuse of doping substances on the team. By uh, knowing about anti-doping rule, rule violations on the team uh, without interfering, uh, even at least in one case, uh, in our opinion, encouraging uh, doping abuse. And uh, finally, uh, one, at least one active uh, case of actually delivering doping substances personally. In our conclusion in the report, we, uh, we found that there was sufficient evidence uh, to prosecute these three persons, these leaders, for violating the anti-doping regulations. 
but due to the statutes, uh, statute of limitations uh, in the, in the anti-doping regulation, it was not possible to prosecute these persons. And we, of course, we cannot say anything about uh, how a case would have ended uh, if brought to the doping tribunal. Um, that is not uh, our job. Our job is to present the evidence. Um, but that will have to remain uh, unanswered. So I will move um, quickly to the general uh, conclusions. And um, yeah, we found from the interviews we did that doping control is still vital to deter at least from cheating. That is still an important element in the anti-doping work. Uh, and that's not just something we uh, say because we are the anti-doping uh, organization. That is actually what uh, almost all of these writers and support personnel, etc., uh, told us. As I have already mentioned, a total, uh, I would say, a lack of leadership in the true sense uh, of leadership, meaning that when you are a leader, in our opinion, uh, you have an extended responsibility to make sure that your employees actually adhere to the regulations and rules that you are competing under. We also found some structural and cultural specificities of cycling that uh, we found actually increased the risk of doping abuse in this a specific uh, sports discipline. And therefore, our recommendations were also addressed in three different areas. The doping control, of course, which is obvious uh, for doping, anti-doping organization, but also when it comes to leadership and structure and cultural things. And you could say that the two latter are maybe not normal things for an anti-doping organization to interfere with, but we thought it was obvious in this case uh, on basis of the many statements uh, we got from the interviews. Since uh, I have limited time here, I will not uh, list all our recommendations. I have selected some of them, uh, and might be some of them you could uh, bring into the discussion afterwards. But one of them was actually that we think that the atom system, which uh, take care of the blood values, uh, we think or we know that some athletes abuse the knowledge they have uh, because they have instant access to their own blood values, blood values, blood values. and we think uh, it could be a thing to consider for VADA to uh, not disclose these values to the athletes instantly at least, at least to, to have a delay on this information. We also uh, found that professional cycling teams should uh, implement rules of good governance in order for the teams to get an increased uh, uh, to have an increased responsibility for their employees. And um, we also found, uh, on basis of our investigation, that professional cycling teams should, may, should be made uh, more uh, or less dependent of single sponsors. Uh, and that could be, for instance, by strengthening the team's possibilities of getting a share of the money for the TV rights. We think they are much too dependent nowadays uh, on individual sponsors uh, who sometimes really put a hard pressure on the individual teams to make results instantly uh, after they have uh, paid the money for sponsorship. And um, we also urge uh, the, uh, the International Cycling uh, Association to introduce rules to make sure that prize money are included into the financial accounts of the team and distributed to riders via the teams instead of being paid directly to the riders. Uh, it will be uh, a way to get rid of, uh, let's say, some of the paperback, brown paperback money we heard about earlier today uh, in this sport. And also we uh, urge the uh, UCI to introduce a so-called witness and truth obligation system, similar to the ones that, for instance, the, the Danish National Olympic Committee has uh, introduced for all their members. So you're actually obliged uh, to tell the truth if you are ask questions by authorities like an anti-doping uh, organization. Um, and fine, finally, uh, uh, the so-called fit for purpose criteria, which has been quite heavily debated, at least in Denmark, after we uh, put this one forward, where we actually suggest that the UCI, before it actually give a license to a sports director, that they should actually uh, not only look into whether they have uh, been uh, they have violated the anti-doping rules and have been, been uh, sanctioned for that, but actually, if uh, more on a subjective basis, we, they think that they had actually dealt with their past 
uh, when it comes to, to doping. That is actually something, together with some of the other recommendations that we are going in Anti-Doping Denmark, together with the, uh, the Danish Sports Confederation, to discuss with UCI in about two weeks' time. And finally, we uh, ended our report with a general uh, appeal, uh, not only to, to cycle, cyclists, uh, riders, but also generally to athletes. Uh, we think, generally, if we should be better in uh, preventing uh, athletes from, from, uh, from, from uh, doping, uh, that they abuse doping, they should actually stand up in public and tell the stories if they have been involved in some kind of uh, fraud, uh, fraudulent behavior. And also, we have seen several examples, unfortunately, within cycling, but also in other sports uh, events, as uh, I was just uh, explaining uh, in athletics, that we should treat the people who are the whistleblowers who actually go public. We should treat them in a decent way. And finally, we urge athletes to actually, when they win and they are clean, why don't sell it in public? So that becomes, hopefully, the uh, state of the art in the future. If you are interested, the whole report can now be downloaded also in English uh, at our website. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, the title of uh, this session is A New World Code Against Doping, and WADA is responsible for this uh, world code against doping. So, to enlighten us on what w WADA is doing on the, um, the new code uh, from 2015, it's Frederick Donce. I don't know if I pronounced it right, but uh, you said it Very didn't good. matter how I pronounce it. Uh, you are the director of WADA's European office, as well as of WADA's relations with international sports federations. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas, and uh, <laughs> good evening, everybody. Uh, my presentation will be slightly more process-oriented and uh, somewhat less exciting than the previous ones, but uh, we thought in agreement with uh, Jens, that uh, the theme of this session being around the 2015 World Anti-Doping Code, and most importantly around the question, who is willing to comply, that it was important to give you a bit of an information on how WADA is planning to monitor compliance with that 2015 code, which came into force at the beginning of this year. You will all know by now that the World Anti-Doping Code is the global framework that provides and details the roles, rights, and responsibilities of athletes and all those involved in the anti-doping system and provide a harmonized guidance to uh, the anti-doping organizations around the world. And it is WADA's responsibility, which is enshrined in the World Anti-Doping Code, to monitor compliance of those who have signed the code uh, with the various requirements of the code. Now there is a challenge, and a significant one, and the question here is how do you monitor compliance with a document when you have more than 600 signatories? And I'll go to that particular aspect a little bit later in my presentation. But before doing that, I thought it would be good to go into a little bit more of the practical details of the World Anti-Doping Code and the signatories of this World Anti-Doping Code. As you probably be, will be aware, the World Anti-Doping Code has a number of various categories of signatories. These are international sports federations, national anti-doping organizations, national Olympic and Paralympic committees, and major event organizers such as the International Olympic and Paralympic Committee and other organizations of major events. The governments are not signatories per se to the World Anti-Doping Code. WADA is a bit of a hybrid animal in the sports world. We are funded and composed in equal parts by the governments of the world and the sports <laughs> movement. And in this regard, governments told us since the inception of the World Anti-Doping Code in 2004 that this hybrid nature of WADA would prevent many of them from being directly signatory to the World Anti-Doping Code. So governments decided to create 
an international convention against doping in sport under the umbrella of UNESCO, through which, by ratifying the convention, they abide to the principles of the World Anti-Doping Code and they commit to anti-doping. Let me just say that this convention has been developed, drafted, ratified in a record time, and as of today, 182 of the 185 UNESCO member countries have ratified this convention. WADA is not responsible for the monitoring of this convention. UNESCO is, and in a few days in Paris, the fifth conference of parties of the International Convention Against Doping in Sport will gather and will discuss these specific matters as related to government. For those who signed the World Anti-Doping Code, compliance involves two main elements. One is the compliance of their anti-doping rules, and this is a work that WADA does almost on a daily basis with anti-doping organizations, ensuring that anti-doping organizations, signatories to the World Anti-Doping Code, have incorporated all of the mandatory requirements of the World Anti-Doping Code into their own rules. And the second aspect, which is the most complicated one when we speak of more than 600 signatories, is the compliance of programs of signatories with the World Anti-Doping Code and ensuring that the practice of the code by the signatories reflect the rules and reflects the best practices involved in the World Anti-Doping Code. Let me just go back two seconds to that previous slides because Sandro Donati also spoke of national federations. And I think it is important also to specify that WADA is not responsible for monitoring the compliance of national federations with the World Anti-Doping Code. This would bring us to several, several dozen thousand signatories of the code. But we expect those who are responsible for national sports and international sports, namely NATOs and IFs, to monitor the compliance of the national federations and to ensure that their actions are in line with the code. Historically, WADA has monitored compliance with the code on a number of different levels. We were asked by, we, WADA management, was asked by our governing bodies, namely our executive committee and our foundation board, which are composed of 50% of government representatives and 50% of sports representatives, to conduct a soft monitoring of the compliance of signatories with the code. And we had to publish a report in November 2011 on the level of compliance of the signatories. It must be said, and it would be recognized by all those governing WADA, that it was really a minimum compliance level requirements that was asked from signatories. We have spent quite a bit of time during the first few years of the existence of WADA to try to ensure that the foundations in place for anti-doping were strong enough to enable the conduct of anti-doping programs across the world. And this took quite a bit of time, and this is reflected in that report in 2011, where the importance of that report was really to look at if the foundations were in place in all sports and countries in terms of some of the basic requirements. What do you expect from an anti-doping organization to conduct testing, to conduct education activities, and so on? But there was also an agreement and an understanding from everybody that this was just a first step, that if we wanted to enhance the effectiveness of anti-doping in the longer term, we would need to look into the quality of the practice of anti-doping organizations, at the way these anti-doping organizations were practicing the World Anti-Doping Code. And in the meantime came the 2015 World Anti-Doping Code. For those of you who are not very familiar with anti-doping, there was a very extensive consultation process throughout 2012 and 2013, where WADA opened basically the floods and opened the doors to anybody who wanted to contribute to the review of the World Anti-Doping Code. When you have, of course, a universal document such as the World Anti-Doping Code, it is important to ensure that this document reflects the realities of anti-doping and of the practice of doping also around the world and is an adapted tool to the practice 
of those who conduct anti-doping on the field. This involved thousands of comments. This involved in numerous meetings. This involved quite a number of different phases of consultation, which at the end of the day were incorporated into a final version of the 2015 World Anti-Doping Code, which was approved at a world conference organized in November 2013 in Johannesburg, South Africa. And these are some of the elements that stand out uh, as significant in the new code and towards which anti-doping organizations in the future will be assessed. One is an increased focus on prevention and education. You will all have heard also about the fact that there were significant discussions around the length of sanctions. And the consensus that was found at the end of the consultation period was that there was a strong wish of all those involved in anti-doping that what I may call the serious cheaters, intentional cheaters, receive a four-year sanctions for first serious anti-doping rule violations against two in the past. And that those cases which may involve more of negligence, for example, be dealt with with more flexibility. The 2015 World Anti-Doping Code also focuses in an enhanced way on the athlete entourage, on intelligence gathering and intelligence sharing which are very much in line with the evolution of anti-doping, as we've heard from a number of previous presentations. And there is also a focus, an enhanced focus, on what we hope will be more quality testing, ensuring that the testing that is being done is as smart as possible, that resources are optimized. And this goes through uh, good testing strategies, of course, but also through the sample storage to ensure that as technique and science evolve, these can be benefited from for the purpose of retesting, reanalyzing samples that have been stored. And in this regard, the statute of limitations in the new code have passed from eight years in the pre-2015 code to 10 years in the 2015 code. So these are some of the elements that are some of the significant elements of the 2015 code. And in the period since the adoption of this code from November 2013, 2014, 2015, WADA has spent quite a bit of time actually working in collaboration with the code signatories to ensure that one, they had rules in line with the new World Anti-Doping Code, and two, ensuring that they were ready actually to practice this code and to put into practice what we all believe are better rules in order to enable effective anti-doping. It is interesting to see that today, 10 months after the entry into force of the code, a few signatories still do not have rules in line with the World Anti-Doping Code. And this is something, when I'm speaking of compliance monitoring, this is something that will be discussed by WADA's governing bodies our executive committee, foundation board, at their meetings in two weeks in Colorado Springs, in three weeks actually, in Colorado Springs, to decide whether any uh, declaration of non-compliance should be made. At the same time, these governing bodies will also look at a number of countries where there is evidence that the National Anti-Doping Organization does not use what are accredited laboratories, with the limitation that this involves in terms of monitoring, of course, of the follow-up that is being done from the cases. So how will WADA monitor the compliance of signatories with the 2015 World Anti-Doping Code? This is still a work in progress. There are quite a number of reflections at the moment. Uh, one thing for sure is that this monitoring will start in 2016 and we have a few certainties at the moment. The first one is that WADA has created what we call a compliance review committee, which will act as an intermediate body between WADA's management, which must monitor the compliance of signatories on a day-to-day -day basis, and the decision-making bodies at WADA, uh, in the case of compliance, the 
Foundation Board of WADA. This Compliance Review Committee is an independent committee, sorry, which will guide and supervise the work in terms of compliance monitoring and which is composed by representatives of athletes, of sports and governments, which are the two sets of main stakeholders of WADA, but also, interestingly, by also a number of compliance experts coming from other fields and industries, uh, in this case, uh, aeronautics and the pharmaceutical industry. In addition to that, the code compliance monitoring process will also be ISO accredited. We thought it was important in order to be as consistent, as objective, and also as transparent as possible to accredit the process through which we will monitor the compliance of the code signatories. And last but not least, as I said earlier, every, everybody wants very much to focus on the quality of the signatories programs. There are a number of tools, of sources, which will be of interest and which will be of use in that compliance monitoring exercise. One is a new requirement from the 2015 World Anti-Doping Code and the International Standard for Testing and Investigations, which is that every anti-doping organization now will be required to conduct a doping risk assessment. A doping risk assessment that should then inform the test distribution plan, but also the storage of sample strategy, as I said earlier. There is quite a number of information available also in the Adams Clearinghouse. There are testing statistics, which should be consistent with the risk assessment of the anti-doping organizations. Adams allows us also to look at the athlete passports and to ensure that anti-doping organizations follow up the abnormal athlete passports. There will be a self-assessment questionnaire also, which is being developed by WADA and which will be sent to all anti-doping organizations. We're very much aware that self-assessment has its limitations, but this will be a good way to gather as much information as possible, and we will ask the signatories to validate, actually, their responses. We will not take the information as granted, but we will want every information to be validated and documented. And last but not least, this is a daily task of WADA. We monitor compliance of the anti-doping organizations also by reviewing all of the doping-related decisions by, by the signatories. WADA has an independent right of appeal of these decisions, and this is another important uh, element also that we will be able to use as part of that monitoring exercise. This exercise is intended also to be as dynamic as possible, and it will involve dialogue with the signatories, but it will also involve the possibility for WADA to conduct audits of the signatories. All of these things to try to gather as much as possible. Once again, all the sources will be explored to monitor and to assess the compliance of the various signatories. There is, I thought it was important to say it here, there is a clause in the World Anti-Doping Code that involves also exceptional circumstances to excuse cases of non-compliance. I should be clear here, we don't speak of uh, minor uh, exceptional circumstances. If we speak of exceptional circumstances, this involves things such as natural disasters, wars, and so on. Now, to conclude my presentations, I would just like to give you a few, not thoughts, yeah, these are not thoughts, but uh, bits of information on the consequences, potential consequences of non-compliance. This is a question we often have at WADA, and we saw from the previous presentations, uh, this is a question that is very much discussed as well. Uh, what happens if a national anti-doping organization, an international federation, is not in compliance with the World Anti-Doping Code? And I think we must be very clear here. WADA does not have sanctioning powers for cases of non-compliance. We report cases of non-compliance to our stakeholders, which have powers of sanctions, but the sanctions we can take and which are included in the code and in the standards are, I might call them symbolic, they might be a bit more than symbolic, but basically a country may lose the accreditation of its laboratory, for example, 
if its national anti-doping organization is not in compliance with the code, uh, a country that does not have a NATO compliant with the World Anti-Doping Code may not have the possibility of appointing members to what as governing bodies. These are rather soft sanctions. The stronger sanctions are in the hands of those who are our stakeholders. And the Olympic Charter says very clearly that uh, in, the inter uh, in the Olympic program, a sport which wants to be part of the Olympic program must be in compliance with the World Anti-Doping Code. This is the same thing for Paralympic Games. The code sets out also a number of consequences, such as the fact that the IOC will accept bids only from uh, countries for Olympic Games, sorry, from countries where the government has ratified the UNESCO Convention and where the NOC, the NPC, and the National Anti-Doping Organization are in compliance with the World Anti-Doping Code. And last but not least, uh, uh, the code mentions also the fact that the IFs and major event organizations should do everything possible to award their major events only to countries that are in compliance with the code. The Compliance Review Committee has expressed the willingness of discussing further other consequences. This is something that will be discussed in November in the future as well by the Compliance Review Committee, but also by our governing bodies. But this is the situation for now, and I thought it was important so to give you some information on this. Andreas, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes my presentation, and uh, I look very much forward to the ensuing discussion. Thank you. Can the, the panelists enter the panel, and then we can start the Q&A session. Can you turn on the light a little bit, because I don't see you that much from here now. Uh, give me a sign, and I will... I guess you will have a, a microphone from someone in the, uh, around you. Can you turn on the light a little bit? I rarely see you up there. Uh, give me a sign and I will note you and I will give you the word. Yes. Politiken, there. Just give me a sign, and if I tell you that I registered you, you just wait for your opportunity. Can, can I ask a question now? Yes, feel Co free. Uh, my name is Jeb, I'm from the Danish newspaper Politiken. Uh, I guess it's mostly for, uh, for Mr. Dunsay. Uh, you're saying that the consequences should be executed, uh, so to speak, by the IOC and the international federations, but on the other hand, we hear Mr. Sappel's uh, uh, presentation about the Russian uh, system being corrupt and uh, systematic doping there. Does the IOC and the international federations live up to their responsibilities uh, in terms of uh, safeguarding the, the world uh, uh, anti-doping code? Well, that's a, that's a good question, but this is, this is not a question I, 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 can, I can reply. I mean, I can reply on behalf of WADA, and we have to work with the, with, the, with the framework that has been attributed to us. I think that you've seen from my presentations, uh, and, and you, you repeated it, WADA does not have sanctioning powers, basically. So it will be up to those who can take decisions, including the IOC, to address the situation potentially of non-compliance that will be uh, that will be referred to them by WADA. I cannot go further than that and speculate at the moment, but this is the situation we are in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Follow up. Comment to that. Um, I would like to add one comment to that. It is not only, uh, as I said, a problem for Russia, it's also a problem for IWF. And here you see the problem, the interest of conflicts. Uh, the Olympic movement is a stakeholder of WADA. The IWF is a part of the Olympic movement. The uh, um, federations have the power of sanctioning, but here is the stakeholder is a problem. Should the stakeholder uh, sanction himself? I think that's a problem. Okay. Okay. <coughs> the, please, when you ask the question, first your name and your affiliation, and then the question. Okay. Um, my name is Harry Anders Solberg. Uh, I come from Trondheim Business School. I'm uh, an economist, and uh, I mean, first of all, thanks for, for interesting presentations. Uh, no critique of you, but I think there is a dimension that is missing in the debate, because very much focus is on test, 
penalties, encouraging uh, athletes to unveil and so on, and that's fine, of course. But uh, what is missing in an, in this, is a debate or, let's say, an understanding of the market forces. Because it's, to me, it seems like the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Because if you take some sports, such as cycling, I mean, the three most prestigious uh, events, Tour de France, Giro d'Italia, and the Spanish Vuelta, I mean, I would call them inhuman, because men or women are not made to compete three weeks in a row, by 250 kilometers. I mean, that's pushing us beyond the extreme. And uh, so I think sports need to take an inward scrutinizing at themselves. I mean, do we create an environment that encourages doping? I mean, of course, you benefit from doping when, uh, when you do a 100 meter race, but you benefit substantially more when you're biking in the Tour de France or the Giro d'Italia and so on. I mean, I know that there have been suggested to cut down, reduce from three weeks to two weeks, but they, they're not willing to do that. And another example, other sports who want to compete uh, or, or to copy uh, cycling is uh, skiing. I mean, they started the Tour de Ski some years ago, and now they have another Tour de Ski in, in the Vancouver, where they, where they participate eight days in a row. And the first experience from the first Tour de Ski was that a lot of uh, at least when sick afterwards, because it's too extreme, actually. So I think com my, my conclusion is sports should not only look at the penalties and, 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 and uh, well, punishment and whatever it is, but also take a look at themselves. I mean, should we change the sports the way they are uh, performed in, an, in a way of uh, uh, reducing doping? Uh, will anybody of you comment the comment there? Or? It was not a question, it was a comment, but you can comment on the comment. Yeah, but I take it as a question anyway, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm by no means an expert in, in cycling or in any other sports for that matter, but I, I, think, I think you're right in many ways, and that's also why uh, we found that in our uh, investigation, in our report, it was actually not to excuse the individual uh, doping offenders, but actually also to try and and uh, put light uh, and share light on some of the uh, circumstances uh, surrounding sport that actually uh, maybe not encourage, but at least makes it more uh, easy to be to be pressed somehow into a situation where you dope. I mean, we, we also know stories about very young riders coming uh, as young professionals to uh, to a foreign country and other culture, and suddenly someone is standing there and more or less pressuring them to, to take something they don't even know what is, and not to excuse still the individual uh, offender, but definitely the, 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 the uh, responsibility, the enhanced resp responsibility lies on the leaders and on the entourage, as is also uh, mentioned in the new uh, water code. So I think we are aware of that, but, but how to solve it is, is difficult. But I think we, what, the only thing we can do is when we uh, reveal these kind of uh, let's say, uh, uh, miss uh, yeah, yeah, things that are not working if, uh, to, to, to protect the clean athlete uh, when it comes to structural things uh, within the sports disciplines. We have to address it, and we have to address it through VADA, through the uh, International Sports Confederations, uh, through the International Olympic Committee. That's the only way to, to change it. I, I, I agree with that, and, uh, and I think your, your point is, is, is absolutely valid. I think that it unfortunately goes, and, and it's not to not take our responsibilities, but I think it unfortunately goes way beyond anti-doping, and it's actually a responsibility of each sporting organization to look at the chargers, uh, charges and burdens that are, that are imposed on the athletes, including, including physically. And uh, we can only deal with the environment we have in terms of anti-doping. We can try to work as much as possible in terms of prevention. But I think it's really a responsibility of the broader sports world to look at each of their particular sports uh, and see if the calendar, the charges that are imposed on the athletes physically or through other means. I mean, we know the levels of pressure that exist in, in some sports also to perform through the environment and through the entourage, uh, if this is really compatible with the practice of a clean sport. Sandro? My point of view is uh, the opinion of a coach, of a trainer, so it's a practical opinion. I think that the, the central point is the educational uh, program for coaches, for officials, 
and for doctors who collaborate with uh, sport federations. For example, the programs for coaches uh, are based only uh, about the teaching of technique and training methodology, nothing about educational problems, uh, protection of the health, uh, ethics, uh, and, uh, uh, for example, respect the right of the children to play and to family. For the sport environment, uh, also the children are the little adults, uh, and uh, the sport point of view is especially to find the talented subjects. So, I think that the sport environment need an help from the exterior to implement the educational programs. Can I add also something? Yeah. Um, short. Short. Yeah, that, uh, short, yes. Um, I give you a very good example. Last week, the presentation of the Tour de France uh, stages is upcoming next year. Uh, three or four mountain stages in the first week. And uh, if you ask Christian Prudhomme in France what, are, what, what is the reason for, then they answer you, because the people want to see that. And I don't believe that. I think that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The sports promoters in the world, if you talk about the Diamond League in athletics, if you talk about um, uh, cycling, professional cycling, I think the problem is that there, there's a lack of intelligence, there's a lack of ethical approach in the sports movement from certain people who, uh, in, who lead these organizations. And that has to be changed. That means WADA, only a monitoring body, uh, we don't have an international corruption and uh, anti-corruption agency in sports. They need much more power, much more power to, to solve these kind of problems. Uh, before, we uh, before we started this session, I was made aware that Mikael Rasmussen is in the audience here. Could you comment on this, this question? Uh, we, for instance, if Tour de France was only two weeks and uh, no hills, would you dope less? I think we just ride faster. Um, same goes for the 100 meter run. If, if, if it was only 60 meters long, people they would not take less doping, so it would be of non importance whatsoever. So they are wrong? Absolutely. But it, can I ask you a question, because I sure. think it's interesting. Go ahead. If, if, if the tour were, had exactly the same level of difficulty, but was run 30 kilometers of average instead of 50 kilometers, would they make a difference also for the, for the riders? I'm, I'm not sure I got the, the question. The, if the Tour de France had exactly the same length and the same difficulty, but the average speed was instead of 50, would be 30, would it make a difference for the, for, the, for the riders and would the riders accept it? Well, we would be on our bikes for 10 hours a day. Um, <laughs> but it, 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 would, it would lower, the, the, the speed would lower from maybe, whatever, 47 to 45. I mean, the, the, the change would not be that dramatic, yeah. but the result would be the, exactly the same. Yeah. Okay. We can come back to you if you want to, but it's the question there from your name and uh, your newspaper. Yes, because I'm a journalist. My name is Brian. I'm from Extrabladet in, uh, here in Denmark. Um, I have a, a question for uh, Michael, Michael Ask. Um, you said in your presentation and uh, also when you have read the report, it's uh, obvious that uh, you have a lot more information than, uh, than the public uh, knows at this point. Um, you, so to, see, so to speak, uh, protect people who have uh, admitted to uh, doping, perhaps, or at least uh, knowing about doping. So uh, my question is, uh, how will you cope with that fact and uh, the situation that you recommend a fit-for-purpose license for uh, sport directors, yeah. which would mean that you, as uh, the CEO of Anti-Doping Denmark, would be looking at a, a, a doper or a, a, a person who has had something to do, to do with doping apply for a license without being able to say anything. How would you cope with that situation? Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's how life is sometimes. I mean, I had, uh, as Andreas mentioned, I have a 30-year long background in law enforcement, and that's the same when the police investigate. Some, sometimes you get some information that you only get, you get because you promise 
the individual that you will keep it secret. But when that being that's being having said that, I can assure you that there are no uh, people, writers, leaders whatsoever who are not uh, prosecuted because of knowledge uh, we have. I mean, that, that's a fact. But what we have is some information about uh, things happening uh, out, uh, outside the statutes of limitations, first of all, but generally it is more about you know, general patterns and general things about, as I mentioned in my presentation, structures, cultural things that we can actually uh, use, especially in the recommendations we gave. So there are no... Uh, no ticking bomb uh, lying anywhere, uh, I can assure that. Okay, in the rear there. Hi, I'm Rob Steen for the University of Brighton. It may sound like a really naive question, so forgive me. Um, are there any discussions at all with the people producing these drugs, i.e. the chemists? Sorry, Sorry could you repeat that <laughs> question? <laughs> Is there anybody talking to the chemists, the people who are producing chemists. the drugs? Sandro? Uh, there is a dialogue, but the, 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 the real situation is, uh, is that it's very easy to be negative in an anti-doping control. I give you an example, but I know a lot of examples because I did collaborate with some prosecutors, judges in the different investigations. For example, you could take a little uh, posology of drugs uh, uh, after your uh, window of one hour in which the sports institution could control you. For example, from seven until 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, eight, uh, five minutes past 8, you could take the little quantity and, to, and uh, to be negative if the staff will arrive the day after. This is one method, but there are others. So the problem is that uh, the anti-doping system uh, until this moment is weak. We need not only the, the collaboration of, uh, spe of specialists, of uh, biochemistry, etc., but also the collaboration of the athletes involved in doping. For example, uh, I don't know if the, the Danish anti-doping agency uh, obtained also information about the different methods to be negative in anti-doping control. Rasmussen was involved also in an Italian uh, investigation in which I was consultant of the prosecutor, he knows some methods. Other friends of Rasmussen, they know very well. So the problem is much more complex. If I, if I may just add to that, and, and maybe Michael will, will add us, uh, us to the Danish side. I mean, there are, there are a number of different situations. I mean, one is, as Sandro mentioned, I mean, there are guys sometimes just in their kitchen trying to tweak with the structure of some substances to ensure that athletes will pass the doping control. And this we have heard from a number of athletes who have been caught doping. I mean, we, we, we have now an investigative unit at WADA uh, working in collaboration, including with the national anti-doping organizations. And we try as much, about, as much as possible to interview athletes or members of the entourage who are ready to actually provide information. Then there's another aspect which has to do with the development of substances for legitimate therapeutic purposes. Let's not forget that doping is also, in many cases, the misuse or the abuse of substances that are being developed by pharmaceutical companies to save lives for the purpose of cheating your opponent. And in this regard, we have seen over the last probably five to 10 years, I would say five years, uh, quite an evolution also. It used to be that pharmaceutical and biotechnological companies would not want to be associated with anti-doping, because anti-doping meant doping. It meant not very good for the image of the pharmaceutical industry and so on. Since a few years now, we work more and more with pharmaceutical industries to exchange information. And this includes, in a number of cases, pharmaceutical industry 
sharing molecules that are developing with WADA scientists or with other types of anti-doping scientists to develop detection methods in advance of the substance being on the market or, 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 or close uh, around, the, uh, around the, uh, the, the, the substance hitting the market. So I think from that sp standpoint, which is a more institutional one, there has been also some progress over the past few years. Sandro, uh, 22 seconds. I, I give you another example. If an athlete take uh, an hormone uh, named gonadorelin, it's possible to increase the endogenous production of testosterone. So, for example, uh, the method to control the real situation of testosterone, the longitudinal controls, is very weak. Because if an athlete uses every time gonadorelin, he is always in a, a high level of testosterone, he could demonstrate that is normal level. So the problem is to detect gonadorelin. The director of Colon, a Colonia Laboratory told me, but there is the method. And I asked him, there were some positive cases about uh, gonadorelin in the history of anti-doping? No. So there is no method. Okay, on the right there. Uh, my name is Jörn Skoczek, I'm from Austria. I want to ask, uh, Michael, ask if you know the names of the other owners of this uh, anti-doping uh, machine that uh, Michael Rasmussen owned. Other names in, the, in your report? If I know the other names of... The machine who? that Rasmussen owned in Vienna. Uh, I, I cannot answer that question right now. I, I don't know, actually. I have to check that out. Okay, there. Uh, my name is Skarsted, I'm a Norwegian. Um, I s uh, read from the board that um, Mr. Donser said the VADA was an independent organization. I would like to have a comment on that, seeing the construction of VADA. A comment on the what of what? Excuse me. You had, you yeah, had, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but you, you would like a comment? It, it to be blunt and direct. Are you calling WADA an independent organization? I think I think it's a, and, and thank you for your answer. I think it's a it's an opportunity to clarify this. We're independent because we don't have any of our groups of stakeholders, which has the majority. So we are, as I said composed in equal parts in our governing bodies and funded in equal parts by the Olympic movement and by the government. So in this regard, nobody has the majority around the table, and I think we can say that this provides independence. In numbers? In numbers? Well, it's, it's not to me to judge uh, whether, whether WADA is independent or not. What I'm telling you is that our structure and our funding is independent because we don't have any majority partner in this regard. Maybe Fred is not independent enough to answer this question. What I'm and, I'm a, and I'm a journalist and I would say they are not independent. Just take a look, take a look to Mr. Craig Reedy, which is the current president of, uh, of, of WADA. He is, is writing e emails to, to uh, Russian authorities or Russian politicians and telling them that they can be assured that they will not bother in any way the political relations to, to, to WADA, WADA because of an investigation which is go ongoing against Russia. And to be honest, <laughs> this is unbelievable for a president of a so-called um, um, anti-doping organization worldwide to, to, to uh, have sec secret or confidential uh, communication with, with politicians uh, and at the, at the same time they have to, to, they have to uh, scrutinize, they have to check what's going on in Russia. I think that doesn't work and from my opinion this uh, has been a really major issue but uh, so from my opinion uh, they are not independent, and um, I, I see very clearly, Fred, the, uh, the influence from the sports organizations, 
uh, in regards to WADA. I, I know that they are not very happy about David Howman's approach to some, some issues because he was always talking very uh, open-minded and, and, from my opinion, very honest in regards to some doping issues, the same with Richard Pound some years ago, and Mr. Reedy is exactly the opposite. I have to say that, and that is really a problem. I discussed it with him personally, he knows that, so I can say it also in public, and I think that is really a concern for WADA. <coughs> Okay, I have no names on my list now. Anyone wants to ask a question? Yeah, there. Yeah, Henrik first, and then there. <coughs> Henrik Van from the Danish Institute for Sports Study. Uh, I'm old enough to have been at the first and the second World Anti-Doping Conference in Lausanne and in Copenhagen in that last one in 2003. And the whole uh, message from those conferences were that in the future, Governments will look at the federations and the federations will look at the governments to make sure that they do something. And now we have a story like Russia and IAAF and it turns out that nobody really looks at these countries. Um, so I would like to ask the panel, uh, is it good enough or uh, where, uh, where are we on a scale from state of the art compliance monitoring till a uh, big cover up? Uh, where are we currently uh, on this scale concerning the federations? Are they doing their job and the countries? Are they doing their job? I mean, I have a simple answer. We'll, if, if we do our job properly, we should know it in the coming years. With the limitations I mentioned in my presentations, but we should know it if the compliance exercise is being done as well as possible. We should at least have a few indications. WADA needs much more power. Not, not only what IOC is now asking for, that they have the, the, the authority for the testing, what they need is much more. They, they need more independence from the sports organizations and they need the full, the full results and sanctioning management in the future. If they have that, if they can do that, then they are more independent. So far as they have only the testing, which will happen possibly in future, but they don't have the sanctioning management, then it's not enough. They need everything. They have to be not only the monitoring um, body, they have to be the sanctioning body. That should be the, the future of anti-doping worldwide, from my opinion. <coughs> and you, you need more money for that, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there. Hello everybody, this is Nikolaos Theodoru from Greece. Uh, my question goes to Frederick, but I would like also a position from Mr. Michael Ask. Uh, do you really believe in the power of whistleblowing within WADA? Dear uh, Frederick, I would like your position, because we discussed this before off the record. I would like your position as member of WADA, and I also would like to have uh, an answer from Mr. Michael Ask about the power of whistleblowers. I think the power of whistleblowers is absolutely huge, and I, and, and I don't say this because we're in that conference and we had the very good example of, uh, of, of the Stepanov spouses. But I think at the end of the day, I mean, we're speaking of limited powers and so on, and I can assure you that WALA does its very best with the powers we have at the moment, and I think that some things go sometimes beyond our powers and whistleblowers have an absolute important role to play. That's why we have reflected this over the past few years, uh, three, four years, by, by having, as I said, a, a, a number of uh, intelligence and, and, and investigative managers. Uh, we have a, a reporting email on our website where we get very regularly information and some very good information, and whistleblowers in this regard have an absolute important role. Uh, Hayo was mentioning uh, earlier uh, a conference we organize every year at, in, in Lausanne, uh, a symposium for anti-doping organizations where we had the uh, pleasure of having uh, Hayo this year, but we also invited uh, Betsy Andrew, who many of you might know here, uh, who was one of the most active whistleblowers in the whole story of Lance Armstrong. And listening to this kind of testimonies, uh, like the testimony we heard from Benita, Benita Merciades this afternoon, is not only very powerful, but these people help change things. So nobody believes and nobody says that anti-doping is perfect at the moment. We know that the 
evolution that has happened over the past 15 years has been phenomenal, but there remains quite a bit to do. And whistleblowers, especially in that trend of anti-doping where we rely more and more of non-analytical evidence because we know that science progresses on a daily basis, but science is not the absolute solution. And in this regard, and I'm sure Michael will concur with that, uh, whistleblowers have an absolute key role to play. But, but we also heard today that uh, the protection of whistleblowers is not that great. So yeah. what can we do to protect them or help mm. them when they come with their information? Yeah, first of all, I, yeah, I actually agree with you, <laughs> uh, luckily enough. Um, of course, whistleblowers are, are, are crucial to, I mean, that's sometimes the only way we can get forward with uh, combating uh, anti-doping. As, as we all know from the Lance Armstrong case, yeah, I mean, testing didn't do it. And we have to rely on people coming forward. Uh, also, sometimes we have to protect their identity if that's necessary to, in that way, uh, gain a, a greater uh, goal than, than just punishing some individual uh, people. That's, that's my opinion. That's, that's also s the, the way we have to, to, I think, address the general integrity problems we have in sports, not only anti-doping, but also match fixing, uh, et cetera. So, so, of course, whistleblowers are important. And, and, and uh, yeah, how to protect them, that's, that's an, uh, not a very uh, easy uh, question to answer uh, very clearly. But we, I think we have to look a little bit upon how um, society in other aspects actually protect people who are whistleblowers. Um, I think that's the only way, and we probably have to, to consider uh, internationally and also nationally to, uh, to, to, uh, to cooperate closer with other authorities that can actually provide the protection that these people sometimes unfortunately need. But, uh, yeah. but from my point of view, I have to admit that we cannot guarantee 100% protection. No, it's, it's absolutely not possible. And um, we tried our best to protect Vitali and Julia, but we don't have a witness, uh, kind of witness protection, protection program. We don't have that. And uh, be, that is beyond our limits, and that is f for sure also beyond the limits of uh, anti-doping organizations, because they are not authorities, at least not state authorities. So that's quite complicated. On the other hand, you have to say, if we try to avoid that the, the name of the person and the, the identity is never published, that is what we can do. And uh, But we cannot protect them on a 24-hour daily basis. It doesn't work. So. But on the other hand, you have to say that sometimes it's really dangerous what they are doing. I, I, can, I can tell you, I was in North Korea in 2011, and um, it was a coincidence, but in Germany, when we, after we, we went back to Germany and we did a story about North Korean sport, we went to a football game during the f f Women's World Cup, and um, four or two, I don't remember, uh, female uh, f uh, North Korean fo footballers have been tested positive. You don't, uh, this is not a witness program, but you never know, you have no possibility to check what happens with these people in North Korea afterwards. What happens with the coach, what happens with the doctors, you don't know. That means it shows again that, that, that anti-doping organizations need much more cooperation with state-run authorities to avoid any danger for witnesses, for whistleblowers. <coughs> Uh, Michael Rasmussen, can I ask you a question? Would you recommend more riders to blow their whistle? Like they say? Um, if you say well, no, then you have to tell us why not. Yeah. Um, it's a very difficult situation because, uh, as far as I know, many of the riders who actually did it were not looked up very well uh, on from our our own uh, organization, being the UCI, both uh, Manzano, Floyd Landis, Tyler Hamilton, and myself, we have all been um, named as, as liars uh, from our own, uh, own government, that being the UCI, um, by various presidents. So that certainly puts the riders in a very difficult situation. Okay, thank you. And um, it's there, it's there. Hi, Andy Brown from the Sports Integrity Initiative. Um, Michael Ashenden, um, in his the parliamentary hearing, was, was held in the Little UK. Little bit louder? Yes, yeah, sorry. Andy, Andy Brown from the Sports Integrity Initiative. Um, Michael Ashenden, in his presentation at the UK parliamentary hearing into the IWF blood data, 
said it's in nobody's interest to expose sport's dirty underbelly. It's not in the interest of the athletes, it's not in the interests of the federations, and it's not in the interests of the public, well, the country, if you like, to expose it. Um, so given what we know about the corruption of FIFA, given that we know that the IWF may have failed to protect the athlete data, or it may have leaked it into the public domain, we still don't know, um, and given what we know about what happened at the UCI, how can you, as sports bodies, convince the public that you can adequately tackle anti-doping and not just administer it? Was that a question? Or <laughs> it's, it's a general question to the panel, to all of you guys, really. I'd like, well, I if, think if you can all give a view, that would be wonderful. I think if, if, we, if we look at what's going on right now with the FIFA scandal and, and, and all, everything, I think it's, it's quite obvious that the sports organizations themselves uh, are not uh, in a position to actually protect the integrity of their sport. I think it's important, it's crucial that the governments uh, generally all over the world really uh, do whatever they can to, uh, to protect the integrity of sports when it comes to anti-doping and match fixing and whatever the problem is. And, and obviously we, we know that the, 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 the limits, the level of that uh, support from the governments are not the same all over the world. We know that. We, we can only do, I think also it was mentioned uh, at the latest um, VAR executive committee meeting where I was, uh, because it was in Copenhagen, I was there as an observer and it was also raised the, the question that we have been spending the last couple of years uh, doing, uh, improving our techniques to actually detect uh, substances when it comes to, to doping. But maybe we should more concentrate in the future, and I think that also applies to what Fred uh, showed in his presentation. Now we have to really be more uh, thorough on compliance. Uh, that is actually where the problem is right now. Of course, we can probably still develop our methods uh, in detecting uh, illegal substances, and we can and we should uh, enhance our uh, collection of uh, intelligence, etc. But the problem lies where the, some governments, some countries uh, are still not complying. And um, yeah, we can only use opportunities like this uh, and the influence we have uh, in, in our governments to, to put more pressure on. Um, if I may add to this, uh, Andy, I, I think it may not be uh, at the benefit of the sports movement and sports organizations uh, to expose doping on a, a short term. But look at the midterm and the long term, and I think that the example uh, that we spoke about a bit earlier with the UCI is an example of an organization that was forced by the events to look into their anti-doping program. I think that the reforms that have been made, without wanting to be naive, but the reforms that have been made within UCI probably are going in the right direction. And, uh, and what we hear, at least, from the riders and from the cycling specialists is that doping in cycling has probably reduced quite significantly over the years, even if I wouldn't be as naive as to say that there is no doping in cycling. But I think it shows that if you don't pay attention to integrity and to doping in particular, and you're an international federation, you may find yourself in a position in a few years where as cycling confronted, you may lose a number of licenses, you may lose sponsors, you may lose broadcasters, and you may have to rebuild all of your reputation and all of your sport over the next few years. So I think that the, this is a strong message, I think, for the sports world. You may not care about integrity for now, but you may be forced to look at it because of various scandals and events. Short. Yes, I would like to use this opportunity to ask Michael Rasmussen because he is here in the room. Yeah. I did a story in 2008 about the Vienna Blood Bank and I was claiming that you have been one of the clients there and uh, Rabobank and, 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 and you re refused everything, denied everything, said it's not true. I would ask the question now, uh, seven years later, what was the reason for that it was not possible for you to tell the truth? Because I was still active. Sorry? I was still active. I still had a very strong desire to come back. What about your entourage at that time? Did they tell you that you, it, it would be better not to tell the truth? Who? It was your decision, your personal decision? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was still, uh, I was still not done as an athlete. Hmm. Um, and I, was, I, was, I still had the feeling that I was taken away from a potential Tour de France victory 
uh, on on wrong basis. Um, certainly, uh, taking into account that the eventually I was punished by VADA rules that came into effect a year and a half half uh, after the actual so-called violation took place. So I was certainly not in a position where I was about to admit anything at that time. Okay. In the rear, there, yep. Yes, my name is Meta Hartley, or I'm uh, the chairperson of the Danish Anti-Doping Agency. Uh, and I'm also a lawyer, a law professor uh, with a background in human rights law. And the discussion we have just had about the efficiency of VADA and whether governments and sports confederations are actually sufficiently committed to the fight against doping reminds me a lot about the discussion in the human rights area because we can easily uh, we can easily agree on uh, the, um, what you, the inefficiency of international conventions even though governments sign them and ratify them they're not really committed to them in the end at least not all governments and the same of course goes for all kinds of international collaboration. But then you have to ask yourself, would it be better without the United Nations? Would it be better without VADA if they were not there? And I'm sure that we can agree that it wouldn't be better, that it has been a great improvement that we have VADA, we have the VADA code which has developed. It doesn't mean that everything is very nice it, uh, it only means that we have to be optimistic and look at the opportunities we have to support the fight against them. Because, of course, there are a number of governments who feel committed to the fight against doping. And, of course, you can also find sports federations, maybe national ones, or maybe small federations, or maybe even bigger ones, who also feel committed to the fight against doping. So we have to use this opportunity in the commitment amongst those actors to move forward instead of being too pessimistic. Thank you. Okay, I take this as a final comment from the audience. I have one question for the, all the panelists as a round up. And your answer is, the next conference is dependent on the answer on this question. <laughs> Sandro. You said in your uh, speech that it's possible to get rid of doping. Do you agree? Ayo? No. It's never possible because um, uh, you, can, you can reduce a problem if you want, but you will never get rid of doping because <laughs> it will always give people who want to cheat and to try what they can. So uh, I think this question is asked a lot of times to me, and I will always say you have a street with traffic and there will always be accidents, so there will always be fraud in, in economics, so there will all be che always be cheaters in sports, but what can happen is to reduce the problem, and that is a task of people like besides me. I would, I would Michael? Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, no, it's okay. I actually agree. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like that in society as well. We have criminals, and we also have, uh, in, in, within the world of sport, there will always be people who are willing to, uh, to, to take the risk uh, of cheating. And um, I think that's, that's how it is, but we can reduce it substantially if we keep on working and we keep on strengthening the, the, the powers of, of our organizations. I hope this is a, the, the right answer I'll give for the next conference. But uh, uh, <laughs> I would fully concur with, uh, with, uh, with Michael and, uh, and, and Hayo. I mean, a, a lot of it has to do also with, we were speaking of society and so on, but with human nature. Yeah. And I think you will never uh, make plagiarism disappear completely in the academic world. We, you, you, you will never have speeding disappear completely on the roads. And there was an interesting uh, survey, a very informal survey that was made a few years ago in Switzerland by the National Anti-Doping Agency, which at the end of a Nalpine marathon asked people whether they had taken a prohibited substance without really saying what a prohibited substance is. But, but, but still, I mean, it was very informal, but it was very interesting to see that 70%, I think, of the participants answered yes. And there was no money. How many? I think it was something like 70, uh, 70 part, uh, per percent of the participants. 70. 70, yeah. And it had nothing to do with money. We always speak of the influence of money and so on. But often, and I'm sure that you can go to a marathon at the end of the marathon and ask people, people may want to cheat those who are prone to cheating because 
they want to improve their time of the previous year because they want to impress their wife, because they want to impress their neighbor. And I think that as long as human nature exists and it will always exist, they will always be cheating. Okay, Sandro, they disagree with you. I think that uh, if we will continue to believe that uh, sport institutions are serious, uh, it's impossible to find a solution. Sport institutions uh, are the origin of doping. They have the to total responsibility. And the, the, the clima, the, the, the feeling of omerta that there is uh, into the sport environment, uh, it's a, a terrible message for the young. In the sport, uh, there is uh, an, an endogenous corruption. I give you an example. If a coach obtain very good results with doping, uh, he became also teacher of training methodology. And he never will speak about doping. He will speak only about the hypothetic quality of his training method. So this is a terrible message for the young coaches, for the young trainer. If we understand the uh, endogenous corruption of sport, we can begin to do something. If we will continue to say that uh, uh, all the sport institutions are serious, there are no solutions. Okay, Michael. Very surely, I yeah. just want to say, we might never totally get rid of the doping problem, but the reason we should keep on fighting it is actually to protect the clean athlete, the athlete who actually have the ethics and the moral in place. And that's, I think that's the most important. Okay, with these answers, I can promise you that doping will be a topic uh, <laughs> next Play the Game conference. Thank you to the panelists, thank you to the audience. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.